Yeah, you tell him, Udo. Get your balls to the wall, man. <laughs> oh, welcome, everybody. This is Balls to the Wall right here live with you. Uh, Grimnir, yeah, that's me, uh, on this Friday night, June 8, 2018. And, and we're, we're ready to do some uh, Balls to the Wall show. Moose Girl is... Is up in the cities, the cities, St. Paul, Minneapolis. There, uh, with, with uh, having a little graduation party for her twin boys that graduated from high school last Friday, last Thursday, last Friday. One of those days. I don't know. Either way, just last week they they graduated high school. Week before that, they both turned 18. So uh, uh, kind of a double dipping of adulthood there for those boys. Uh, good, good to see them. Uh, Moving along, I, I, you know, they were just little kids. First time I talked to Moose Girl, <laughs> they, they, were, they were like uh, eight years old, I think. First time I talked to Moose Girl, they were just little brats running around in the background while she was trying to talk to me. <laughs> now they're larger brats, I guess. Uh, whatever, they're, they're 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 young men at this point, with all the responsibilities that that entails, and they'll be off to college soon enough. Anyway, she's up there with a party for them. And next week she'll be gone, too, because she will be at, well, she'll be at home in Eau Claire, but there's a festival in Eau Claire called the Blue Ox Festival. comes around annually, and she'll be attending the Blue Ox on Friday night next. So uh, you'll have me again next week here. Balls to the Wall, Grimner on RealLibertyMedia.com. And RLMRadio.xyz and any other place that we be being we may be being broadcast. <laughs> Easy for me to say, I know. Now today, earlier today, uh, over there on uh, one of our friendly friendly networks, UCY.TV, they shut down. Uh, uh, anyway, it was it was Jules, the the owner and operator there of UCY.TV. She performed her last show, uh, her last regular for now show on UCY.TV, her before the first cup program that she did in the mornings. Now, uh, from what I understand, uh, she's going to at least take the summer off and then possibly, uh, or probably maybe even, uh, start back on Spreaker. Uh, coming in, uh, you know, September, October time frame, a after the summer is over. Um, and, and she's still got some other shows to uh, uh, possibly close out over there on UCY. Uh, I know she said at the end of her broadcast today that Hal would still be live on Sunday. So there's that. Um, I, I don't know what else there is going on with that over there. But um, sad to see, you know, another voice of freedom. Uh, fading away uh, uh, in in that manner, but she has to do it for her own health, for her own health reasons. Uh, she she had a you know a little medical issue going on, and uh, and uh, so she needed to uh, focus on herself to keep herself good and healthy and well. Uh, and uh, I, I applaud her for doing so, for focusing on herself in such manner. So uh, anyway, we may get a host or two, a radio show host. Um, maybe more, I don't know, for, from UCY.TV. I've been contacted by two of them. Um, so we'll see if, if they come through uh, or not. And if they are, I don't know if there are kind of programs. I say our kind, as if you and I have the same kind of program. <laughs> well, I don't know if they're my kind of programs, but if they want to stream here, I'll let them stream here. Whether or got not you guys, any anybody here listens, that's up to y'all. Um, uh, but, you know, they, if they, they're looking for a place, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm happy to help them out there. Um, anyway, uh, it's just a side, side show note. Um, this is the, the first week that I am using strictly OBS to broadcast rather than using uh, Webcam Max and OBS. Or prior to using OBS, uh, when when we were still on live stream, uh, I used Webcam Max and the Web Broadcaster tool from live stream, uh, which was really a pig. 
Um, OBS seems to, to act a lot nicer, and it's got a lot better features, too, um, as, as far as setting up various things. Uh, they, they call these scenes. <laughs> There's some different terminology going on uh, there in, in, in OBS than there is in other programs. And I know that uh, unless you're a, a, a broadcaster of video yourself, um, you say, who cares? But if you ever want to, uh, just remember, OBS, it stands for Open Broadcast System. It's a, it's a cross-platform, free, open-source program that you can download. Um, and so... Definitely check that out. I'm also I'm still using Butt for the audio stream, but uh, this this works great for uh, well, both for YouTube live broadcasting and and Vaughn live broadcasting and oh a, a whole buttload of others that they have pre-programmed in and even those that they don't have pre-programmed in, uh, you can get your broadcasting key from whatever service it is that you use to stream your your stuff to uh, just. Glad that Vaughn was on there, and I was able to find them and get them going. Um, by the way, the uh, Ustream people, yeah, no more free Ustream either. Uh, live stream shut theirs off now. Ustream shut theirs off. Uh, of course, Ustream is not U Ustream anymore. Ustream is IBM something or the other. I forget what, but either way, um, so they shut their crap off. <laughs> Oh, God. Anyway, so uh, anyway, how do you do the folks over there at Freedoms Network, which, by the way, uh, will shut down on June 23rd, should we not receive at least one month more, which is uh, 30 bucks of uh, server fees, but I, I can't stand it going month by month. You know, people want to pay month by month, I, I, or, or so, actually, very few of the people over there but certain ones very dedicated to the site have been dishing out money and i don't i don't, I, I, I don't I, it's not right um i, I wish uh, if donations were going to come in for that site out of the uh, what is it 260 255 uh members of that site I, I i don't know how many regular users but at least a few dozen um throw a few bucks in if you want the site to keep up keep going um you know, I, I I can't I can't give any money towards it, but I give my time. I keep the thing running. Um, so, you people, if you want that site to keep going, great. Put some money in there, donate it, and and the site will continue going. If nobody donates and it goes away, it actually it makes my life easier. I don't want to see it go away, but again, if it does, it will make my life easier. <laughs> <laughs> to a small degree, um, so so bear that in mind. Um, <laughs> oh, anyway, howdy to over everybody over here in the Real Liberty Media dot com uh, chat room on IRC dot net, uh, and welcome to y'all, Cowboy Tech, myself, Miss Kate, as Mo Bessie, Chloe, uh, Chalcedony, another Chloe, <laughs> free enslaved and Gramsy. Who, thank you for the, uh, the podcast there, uh, blog thing, Grammy. Um, Don C. and Java Doctor and JJ's, uh, JJ Uwick, uh, Wana Taco and Rain and Fluke Bot, uh, Mr. Rob Works, Trust No One, uh, but a bit of Phantom, Beetle, Colfax, who else we got? Oh, Dakota, Dima, Frumpy, hiding out down there below. Uh, I thought I had you on auto voice. Anyway, whatever. We got Don C and Kozu. I, think I thought I had more of these people on auto voice. All right, I'll have to check some of those later. We got uh, Kozu and Moe in, in several poxes. <laughs> several poxes on the house. Uh, and Pones House and Sock Puppet and Skittle. Yes, all y'all. Uh, welcome to the show. Um, it was. It's been a hot. It's been a hot ass week here. I don't know how it is where you were, but it was up to 97 degrees today. It's close to that yesterday. It should be a little cooler tomorrow. I know it's just boiling, but it's it's coming down now. It's it's in the 70s now, here uh, at at 9:13, 9:14 p.m. Uh, in Mountain Time Zone, up here in the mountains, <laughs> in the desert mountains. Uh, so that's all great. And um, I, 
I think, uh, yeah, I think it's time for some music. Z-Grim? What the hell is that? Is that, is that like C-Grams? That crappy-ass kind of whiskey substitute? <laughs> oh, man, I tell you. <laughs> All right, uh, let's do this. Let's do some tunages from the Tunas. No, not from the Tunas. Not even the Neptunas. This is uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan. Earl Thomas. Eric Johnson. Come on, turn me on. Earl Thomas. Eric Johnson. Woo! Woo, indeed. Yes, indeed. Uh, Eric Johnson, one of the uh, G3 uh, with uh, uh, <laughs> Satriani and Vi. Uh, for any of you that, 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 that have uh, the G3 album from that particular one, anyway. Um, so, yeah, awesome cover there of All Along the Watchtower. Uh, more in the Hendrix style, obviously, than, than the Dylan style, but, uh, yeah, very nice. Uh, before that, we had Pat Travers for Free Enslaved, I do believe, uh, requested. Boom, boom, out go the lights, the studio version of that. You know, I, I don't know if I've heard the studio version of that before. Huh. I can't remember. I didn't have that album. I had the, I had the live one. Um... Uh, what was it? What was that one called? Go for it or something like that. Uh, anyway, anyway, we kicked it off there with a Miss Kate request, Stevie Ray Vaughan and Jeff Healy doing "Look at Little Sister." Yeah, short version. Yeah, it was a shorter version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was good though. Um, uh, can't, can't, can't. No, no question about that. Um. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> So, uh, anyway, that's uh, some good, good jamage, good jamage right there for y'all. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, that's good. Okay. Um, now what is this weekend? Oh yeah, that's right. This is Father's Day weekend, right? Am I right on this time? I, I, I think I'm right that this is Father's Day weekend. <laughs> I know some of you out there are fathers jamming in the jammies. All right, Poxy. Um, so I, I think it's Father's Day weekend. So, uh, yeah, so, some of y'all setting up a pool on his roof. Um, it would it, be a little difficult. To, you know, it's a standard slope roof. <laughs> I don't know how, I don't know how well a, uh, a pool would do up on the roof. <laughs> hey, could, could work. I, I, I'm not, I'm not too sure. Oh man. <laughs> oh man. Oh man. All right, let's cover this here because, well, we can, and it, and it's here in my list, and I, and I gotta, I gotta share some stories with you. Yeah, yeah, it would be better on the patio. Maybe in the in inside. I got I got I got three patios. It's one on each side of, <laughs> and then an enclosed one. Uh, anyway, two two regular ones and an enclosed one. So yeah, I got, I got three patios. Anyway, uh, from um, the most important news dot com earlier this week. And I bring this up because, really, really, like you haven't been doing this all along, but here it is, from Michael Snyder of the Economic Collapse blog. Anyway, uh, the Department of Homeland Security plans to compile a list of all bloggers, journalists, and social media influencers. <laughs> they say, they've been doing this for years, but whatever. Anyway, uh, it says here, many were hoping that once Barack Obama was out of office, we would see less of this Big Brother surveillance nonsense. 
but instead it seems to be getting even worse. In fact, the Department of Homeland Security has just announced that it intends to compile a comprehensive list of hundreds of thousands of journalists, editors, correspondents, social media influencers, bloggers, etc. And collect any information that could be relevant about them. Meaning, what can we nail them on? If they don't say something we, if they say something we don't like. <laughs> so if you have a website, an important blog, or you're just very active on social media, the Department of Homeland Security is going to put you on a list. Oh, yet another list, should we say. And we'll start collecting information. We'll continue collecting information about you. The DHS has already announced that it will hire a contractor to aid in monitoring media coverage, and they will definitely need plenty of help because it's going to be a very big job. As part of its media monitoring, <laughs> oh, such nice word out wordosity. The DHS seeks to track more than 290,000 global news sources, as well as social media, in over 100 languages, including Arabic, Chinese, and Russian, for instant translation into English. The successful contracting company will have a 24-7 access to a password-protected media influencer database, including journalists, editors, correspondents, social media influencers, bloggers, etc., in order to identify and any and all media coverage related to the Department of Homeland Security or a particular event. Any and all media coverage, as you might imagine, is quite broad and includes online, print, broadcast, cable, radio, trade and industry publications, local sources, national and international outlets, traditional news sources, and social media. If this sounds extremely creepy to you, that's because it is extremely creepy. <laughs> Uh, Snyder runs uh, several prominent websites, including the Most Important News and the Economic Collapse blog. And so, without doubt, he will be on the list. I might be on the list. I don't know. I, 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 I'm pretty far under the radar. RLM is pretty far under the radar. But you never know. We do, we do, we do stuff. And we say things they don't like. Anyway, he says, and if he was just a name on a list in some database somewhere, that would be bad enough. But instead, it sounds like the DHS will be collecting any information that could be relevant about all of us. Ooh, a free toaster. I'll take that. Um, all right. <laughs> As Gizmodo noted, the DHS vagueness is also a concern. It leaves itself an opening for collecting any other information that could be relevant about these influencers. And there's no hint as to what that might mean. It's strictly functional information, like work histories or sensitive data that could be abused, <laughs> will be abused. Either way, the database could be troublesome for some bloggers and social media stars who aren't usually under such close government scrutiny. This is one of the reasons he wanted to get, get to Washington. This kind of Orwellian monitoring of our freedoms. <laughs> yeah, you think they're freedoms, buddy. Is unnecessary. It is a colossal waste of taxpayer dollars. Taxpayer dollars are a colossal waste of taxpayer, of, 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 non, of people's money. Uh, it's theft. Anyway, and it violates our most basic freedoms. So why does the DHS need to do this? An explanation they are giving the public is weak. Weak tea. The following comes from Forbes. DHS says the NPPD slash OUS, the National Protection and Programs Directorate, Office of the Undersecretary, there's a mouthful for you, has a critical need to incorporate these functions into their programs in order to better reach federal, state, local, tribal, and private matters. 
Who knows what the hell that means? But the document also states the NPPD's mission is to protect and enhance the resilience of the nation's physical and cyber infrastructure. <laughs> oh, but you're not supposed to ask any questions about government programs like this. No, 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 no. It, 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 even for you to know they exist is bad enough. You certainly do not want to question their motives. In fact, just a few days ago, the Department of Homeland Security representative stated that those that are questioning this program are tinfoil hat-wearing black helicopter conspiracy terrorists. Hey, he's talking about me. <laughs> if you find yourself skeptical of this proposal of mass state monitoring of the press, consider yourself a bona fide member of the tinfoil hat-wearing black helicopter conspiracy terrorists. A DHS representative, Tyler Houston, said Friday, It's all very routine, he argued, casting the project as an innocent means of just monitoring current events. Just shut up and let us do this, you crackpots. <laughs> That's right, Sock. Don't mess with my frickin' tinfoil hat. <laughs> This kind of response should make y'all very angry. Just shut up and let us do this, crackpots. If the government is going to monitor us and put our information in a database, we should probably, well, have the right to ask some questions. Freedom of speech is one of our most foundational rights, and many are concerned that monitoring and tracking are merely the initial steps that could lead to a significant crackdown on internet activity. Just check out what's about to happen over in Europe. The internet has made it possible for ordinary people to communicate with one another on a massive scale, and any efforts by national governments to interfere... National governments? Is there another kind? I guess uh, international government? I, I don't know. Whatever. Uh, national governments to interfere with that must be greatly resisted. Unfortunately, it appears this new Department of Homeland Security program is moving ahead rapidly. In fact, it is being reported that seven different companies have already expressed interest in participating. Yeah, with the billions of dollars to be made, um, yeah, I'm sure there's at least that many companies that are interested in doing so. Seven companies, mainly minority and or women or owned small businesses, <laughs> Is it, well, that's the only ones they're considering. We're probably safe. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I've already expressed interest in becoming a vendor for the contract, according to the FedBizOp website. All it takes for evil to flourish is for good men and women to do, it says to be nothing, but I'm going to say to do nothing, because um, that sounds wrong. Be nothing? Anyway, please spread the word about this creepy new surveillance program. To anybody that may actually listen, it's just to anyone here, but, you know, most people don't really want to hear about it. They don't care about it. Uh, it, it, <laughs> it is of no interest to them. Um, anyway, there's uh, that there from Michael Snyder. Thank you for that, Mikey. We, I used to read Mike's news all the time back, on, back in the uh, RLM News Day show days, um, f mostly from the Economic Collapse blog there. But he, he does other sites, too. Uh, anyway, they're, they're, am I an influencer? I don't think I'm an influencer. I don't influence anybody. I go on here and yap about whatever I want to yap about. And nobody cares. <laughs> you want an influencer? Here's an influencer for you. <laughs> From the free thought project dot com. Council on Foreign Relations tells government that they have to use propaganda on Americans. Yes, that's what they said. You have to use propaganda on Americans. And it's not like they really need to tell them. They've been doing this for decades. They've been using propaganda on y'all. <laughs> but they're saying, they're, I guess they just wanted to back up that point, make a little emphasis there on that is a member of the CFR insisted that the U.S. government must use 
propaganda on its own citizens. The CFR delivered the Orwellian... Everybody's using that word, Orwellian. Huh. Anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah, imagine that. <laughs> Orwellian presentation recently, though, uh, that unsurprisingly went unnoticed by the mainstream media, or, as it's properly known, the CLAP, the Corporate Lame Ass Propaganda. So the propagandists just kind of don't want to even bother telling you that they're propagandists, and they're made to use propaganda. They do it anyway because it works great for them, but they don't want to let you know that that's what they, who they are and what they do. Anyway, they made this uh, statement that went unnoticed by the clap in which the CFR's Richard Stengel forwarded the notion that governments have to direct propaganda at their own domestic populations, meaning you're domesticated. Your trained animals. Yes. The council is recognized as one of the United States' oldest and most establishment think tanks of the American power elite. Who wrote this article? Is there a name here? J. Simontopoulos? Simontopoulos? Sir, Sir, I can't say his name. Whatever, J. somebody. J.S. <laughs> Yeah, so um, uh, American power lead, it often sets the agenda of important policy questions. Or as far, former senior el editor at WAPO, Richard Harwood, uh, stated in a column, the ruling class journalists approvingly described the council as the nearest thing we have to a ruling establishment in the USOA. Yeah, via Viva Chick Dick Cheney. <laughs> Free. <laughs> Harwood admiringly, admiringly wrote, The membership of these journalists in the council, however they may think of themselves, is an acknowledgement of their active and important role in public affairs and of their ascension into American ruling class. They have ascended. They do not merely analyze and interpret foreign policy for the U.S. They help make it. They are part of the establishment, whether they like it or not. Oh, they like it. They love it. Sharing most of its values and worldviews. CFR is a key cog in the hub of the Washington think tank promoting endless war. As former Army Major Todd Pierce described, think tanks act as primary provocateurs, using psychological suggestiveness to create a false narrative of danger from some unknown, unseen foreign entity, with the objective being to create paranoia within the U.S. population that it is under imminent threat of attack or takeover at all times. In January 2018, uh, WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange publicized the extensive sway the Council of Foreign Relations carried on the over the U.S. mass media. He was then silenced by, by tweeting a graphic created by Swiss Propaganda uh, Research, SPR, a research and information project on geopolitical propaganda in Swiss media, which illustrated the heavy influence CFR exercises over the media narrative delivered to the American public, i.e., domestic propaganda. <laughs> They've got the graphic here. I think some people shared this graphic here in the chat uh, this week, showing you the top-down scenario from CFR through all of the little, what you think of as independent private media sources. Uh, anyway, they got a link here to that graphic. The illustration of the Council's deeply entrenched media presence is based on the official membership rosters compiled by the SPR, by SPR, uh, revealing interconnections of CFR's extensive mass media influence network and its main international affiliate groups, the Bilderberg Group, huh, covering mainly U.S. and Europe, and the Trilateral Commission, covering North America, Europe, and East Asia. 
according to the report from the Swiss Propaganda Research, largely unbeknownst to the general public. <laughs> yes, who are you? Uh, my name is General Public. Anyway, uh, many media executives and top journalists of almost all major U.S. news outlets have long been members of the influential CFR. Established in 1921 as a private, bipartisan organization to awaken America to its worldwide responsibilities. The CFR and its close to 5,000 elite members have for decades shaped U.S. foreign policy and public disclosure about it. As one council member famously explained, the goal has indeed been to establish a global empire, albeit a benevolent one. I think they spelled malevolent wrong. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'll let you look at the rest of this. There's some videos and and, and a lot of more talk and text about this, but um, uh, you all know this. I mean, this is this is stuff that uh, we talk about here in in the RLM chat every single day, and that we've been talking about for years, years. This is this is no secret to us. This is no hidden information. This is no surprise. Juana Taco points out the CFR founders, David Rockefeller, Alan Dulles, Paul Warburg, Edward House, Mandel House, uh, Herbert Hoover, Walter Lippmann, Christian Herter, Archibald Carey Coolidge, James T. Shotwell, Lionel George Curtis, Charles Seymour, Eustace Percy, First Baron Percy of Newcastle. Oh, well, they make a nice brown lager. <laughs> oh, free and slave says all you really need is a good CGI and you can control everything Clinton global initiative of fake news 3D computer graphics used for creating scenes or special effects oh it's really easy to fool the American people that's really easy to fool the people of any country really I mean it's not like this is be the first time this has been done, and it certainly won't be the last. Oh, by the way, I made a um, coin, a token, a crypto coin. <laughs> I don't, I don't know what to do with it yet. I don't know, I don't know how you distribute it. Um, but uh, via the HTML coin wallet, uh, they they let you create smart contracts which can be used to create tokens. Uh, a token is basically a, a subclass of a crypto coin. HTML coin is a crypto coin. And, and so creating the token below that is, is uh, considered its, its own entity. And so I made one. It's called the RLM coin. And I made a, a amount of coins or supply of coins, total supply of coins of 99,000... 999,999. Just shy of a million. <laughs> now, I don't know what to do with it. I don't know how to make it. I mean, people have to mine these, I guess. I guess they have to mine them. I don't know, but I don't know how would they know that it even exists in order to mine it. And why would you spend money on it or time on it, which energy is money, time. Um, but I made this coin. I'll have to figure out how to use it. Real loose money coin. Yeah, good one, Sock. Good, good, good. Um, <laughs> anyway, so uh, somehow there must be a way uh, to mine these coins. Because when I, when I first produced it, it created uh, or it mined like six-tenths of a coin for me. So something is mining them. I don't know what is mining them. And I don't know how would other, other people would mine them. But apparently there must be a way to mine them. <laughs> Or some, I, I don't know how else, how else could you create, I mean, they got to be created somehow, right? I, I, anyway, I'll figure it out. Anyway, it's there, it's, so it's something new for Real Liberty Media there, an RLM coin. And um, it, it um, uh, knows the miner, yeah, digging for gold. <laughs> All right, enough of that nonsense. Um, I hear some more music. 
Buddy Guy. Buddy Guy has a brand new album coming out right now. Well, not right now. Uh, let's see if the, the release date's on here. Uh, June 15th, the new album will be out. And it's called The Blues is Alive and Well. That, that'll be the name of Buddy Guy's new album. So I, I found this track up here on the YouTubes called Nine Below Zero, which is uh, off of his upcoming new album. Uh, and I decided I'm going to share it with y'all. It's no video. Just, it's just audio. But uh, here you go. Enjoy. Buddy Guy. Brand new. <laughs> Ah, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's Weird Al Yankovic doing Bob, is the name of that particular track. And before that was Bob Dylan doing the Subterranean Homesick Blues. And we kicked it off there with Buddy Guy and Nine Below Zero off of his upcoming album, Look For It. You will want to have it in your collection if you're a, a bluser, a bluser. Any of you bluesers out there? All right. Anyway, <laughs> I imagine there's some of you that are bluesers, I would think, probably, possibly, maybe so, I don't know, maybe so, I don't know. <laughs> oh man, I tell you, it's a funny world. So, anybody got any great plans for the weekend uh, there? Uh, what, what is it? Oh, that's right. I, I said it earlier. It's it's, it's Dad's Day. So who, which ones y'all? Their fathers. Um, I'm thinking. Uh, well, Don is obviously a father, and Rome's is obviously a father, and uh, Java Doctor, and uh, I can't see the list right now because it's it's behind my thing here. Next weekend, not this. Well, not, you see. <laughs> Oh, I'm only a week off again. Well, I thought it was last last Sunday, and then then I said, okay, well, so it must be this Sunday. But apparently, it's next Sunday. Kate says, I, I don't know. I don't keep track of these things. I just know that they're coming up because I get I get ads. I get ads from uh, <laughs> people. <laughs> you know, buy this stuff for Dad's Day. And I was like, eh, there we Who's this? Who's this? Free requested by who? Oh, yeah. All right. We'll do that one, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <sighs> Don't mind me. I'm looking at my list and talking to myself. My list of, of tunages to be requested. All right. Well, then you fathers just have to wait because it ain't your day. Oh, I didn't want to do that one. We'll do that one on different, a uh, different set. All right. But we'll, we'll, keep, we'll save that one for a little later. Um, we'll save that one for a little bit later. All right. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> oh, man. I tell you, I tell you, when you have the, the, uh, the, the broadcasting partner with you, they can just, they can just talk and distract the crowd while you're doing other stuff. And and I got you know other other stuff that uh, uh, need, needs to be doing needs to be doing. All right, well that's all right, that's all right. We'll do that. That'll that'll be fine. That'll be just fine. Okay. Okay. There's all that. Um. Yeah. So uh, Father's Day is a celebration honoring fathers and celebrating fatherhood, paternal bonds and influence of fathers in society. Oh yeah, besides those that are fathers, some of y'all actually have fathers. <laughs> Again, not me. Don't have I'm not a father, and I don't have a father. Uh, apparently at some point I did. There was a donor of certain bodily bodily fluid that allowed me to be produced. <laughs> and apparently he was around when I was born, but uh, not not very long after that, he was no longer around. It's always the third Sunday of June. Okay. I'll um, not remember that next year. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, oh, what do I want to tell you about here? Oh, let's talk about this one. Just because they, even though they don't tell you why, I think you could probably guess why. This is from the Denver Channel dot com. Colorado's economy is the fifth best in the United States of America. That's right. Denver, Colorado, which boasts an unemployment rate below 3%, has the fifth best economy in the U.S., according to a study by the personal finance site uh, website WalletHub. States were given a score based on three main categories. Economic activity, e what economic health, and innovation potential. Huh. wonder where that comes from. Colorado's economic activity, based on factors such as GDP growth and startup activity, was the eighth best in the country. The state snagged third for economic health, which looked at the unemployment rate, the foreclosure rate, the share of the population in poverty, building permit activity, not actually building, it's just permit activity, uh, and other factors. In addition, the Centennial State, as it likes to be called, was fourth in innovation potential, which looked at the state's entrepreneurial activity, the share of jobs and in the tech industry, and more. Colorado's had the fourth most startup activity, uh, tied with Hawaii, Idaho, Iowa, and Maine for the lowest unemployment rate. The state also ranked fifth for the highest median annual income, household income. However, Colorado did not get top marks across the board. The state was among the worst for its exports per capita. Because you can't export the weed. <laughs> it don't matter. It don't matter. Washington was named the best state economy, uh, followed by Utah, Massachusetts, and California. California, really? you got to be joking. Anyway, um, this... The, the study used data from the U.S. Census Bureau, the Bureau of Labor Stats, and the Bureau of Economic Analysis and other income sources to determine its rankings. So as I said, they don't tell you here in this little article why Colorado is ranked so high. Emphasis on high. <laughs> they don't mention weed at all in that particular article, but you know the reason for it. You know the reason Colorado is ranked so high. It's because of all the weed. The reason they're so entrepreneurial. The reason they had so many startups going on there. And so much innovation going on. It is because the fact that they have weed legal there throughout the state. You can grow your own weed. Some of the states that have, quote, legalized weed have not... Um, made it so that you can grow your own weed. Um, they have more dispensaries, they call them. I just call them pot stores uh, throughout the state than, than other, other states do. Um, free enslaved also mentions high in radiation, which they are, uh, because of the elevation, which is also the case here in New Mexico. Um, but, uh, and yeah, we have you know, leftover radiation from days gone by. <laughs> Yeah, yes, we do. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so uh, the, the, it's interesting, though, that they don't mention weed in there, in that article. At least I thought it was kind of interesting that they just decided to, to leave that particular point out of of the whole thing. Now, i, I got to mention this sad story because it's very sad to me. And whether it will affect me greatly or not remains to be seen. I don't think it will, because I, I think the uh, smart people that use this particular site will be, just be creating something new and, and causing Microsoft to take a bath on their purchase. However, oh yeah, Reefer Madness is doing, uh, doing an awesome job there. No question, Sock Puppet. Um, anyway, so this, from earlier this week, uh, from this is on Reuters, hemorrhoiders.com. 
Microsoft to take on Amazon with a $7.5 billion GitHub deal. Microsoft Corporation said on Monday it would buy privately held coding website GitHub uh, for $7.5 billion in an all-stock deal to beef up its cloud computing business and challenge market leader Amazon. The deal is a big bet on Azure, which I don't know if you, any of you have touched any Azure stuff yet or not, but um, not impressed. I am not impressed. Again, it's a Microsoft product, so what do you expect? Anyway, uh, the company's fast-growing cloud business, uh, fast-growing as it's forced, as other Microsoft projects are forced uh, upon their, their, their customers, um, that's how Microsoft gets market share. They force their products down your throat. Go and try out buy uh, and try and buy a new PC that doesn't have Windows built into it, installed on it. Um, yeah, so uh, th there's that. Uh, anyway, so they call Azure a fast-growing cloud business, as it will be able to lure <laughs> more code developers who use GitHub and drive more business to Microsoft. As I said, I'm fairly positive that GitHub, uh, the, the most of the users of GitHub, are not going to want to stick around uh, and, and deal with Microsoft's tricky actions that they always do. Uh, they'll just have another site. It'll just be another site. Yeah, Microsoft, yeah but this, this is from earlier this week. This was on um, Monday, I think, this article came out. Yeah, June 4th, which was Monday, yeah. So at that point, the deal was still going through. Um, anyway, by pulling off its largest acquisition since the $26 billion acquisition of LinkedIn, which was also a bust, by the way, um, <laughs> Microsoft gets a platform of universally known, uh, universally known by developers. GitHub calls itself the world's largest code host with more than 28 million developers using its platform. And, and let me just say, you're dealing with developers here. The first thing you do, Microsoft, that developers are not in favor of, they don't like, they'll just say, screw you, and they'll still they'll move to another site. They'll start their own site. They're the ones that you depend on, that you're not going to get in this deal in the way that you want them to. These people post, people post stuff up there so that it can be shared freely, and that is not words, those words do not fit well with Microsoft, shared freely. Yes, GitLab, yeah, going huge already. A lot of people migrating uh, or just starting out there. Um, so, uh, whatever. They, they want to do try and do this, and I, and I think, like I said, they're going to take a huge bath on this $7.5 billion deal. Anyway, it says, after reports of a likely deal between Microsoft's GitHub emerged on Sunday, some of the users of the software development platform raised doubts on social network Reddit uh, that GitHub would eventually favor Microsoft products over competing alternatives. Duh! <laughs> but Chief Executive Officer Satya Nadella downplayed those concerns by saying on a conference call, that GitHub will continue to be an open platform that works with all public clouds. <sighs> he said Microsoft will use GitHub to promote company's own developer tools and use its sales team to speed up sales team. See, they're already in that. Sales team to speed up adoption of GitHub by its big business customers, and it's possible the big business customers will will flock to GitHub, but they're just a tiny portion of the overall uh, user base there. So, and you probably already have all, all of their stuff in your Azure, anyhow. Uh, the deal reflects the company's ongoing pivot to open source software. Has anybody else noticed the open source pivot by Microsoft? <laughs> and seeks to further broaden its large and growing development community, uh, Moody's analyst, another big money guy, uh, said. <laughs> 
So anyway, I don't need to go through it all to you. I, I'm just saying, yeah, this is this ain't gonna work out well if if they keep if they keep beating Microsoft. Basically, um, Microsoft loves proprietary. That's that's what they do is proprietary, and um, that's what they love. Let's see what let's see what Grammy posted in here. We got a Grammy posting. You see, I I got this thing, and I'm gonna try and see how it works. Um, I, I remember, let's see here, if I go to this one, and there was a way to change this. What was it? Sh shift, Alt, Control? No, not that one. Oh, it's, i, I got to grab the side, right? All right, that's how you do it. All right. I can smaller that by doing this. And then... All right, that's how you do it. Um, <laughs> I'm still learning. I'm still learning OBS to some, to some degree. Anyway, she she posted up this uh, picture of a hand with a barcode on it that says "slave." The government claims the right to tax you. The government claims the right to write rules for you to obey. The government claims the right to punish you for disobedience. In short. The government claims ownership of you. <sighs> yes, they do. That's what they claim. <laughs> yeah, I like this software, this OBS. Speaking of open source. Anyway. Where was I? Oh, yeah, I was here. <laughs> Come on, brain, keep working. Brain, don't fail me now. And and speaking of uh, Microsoft and evil corporations and proprietary and all that stuff, from the MIT Technology Review.com, Technology Review.com, The secret to stopping the robot apocalypse. Popcorn. Butter. Yes, Grammy, I'm having a Grammy moment. <laughs> uh, and, and the other title for it is, um, Humans are... What? Oh, here it is. Humans are still crucial to Amazon's fulfillment process. Imagine that. Humans in warehouses. Anyway, Amazon's fleet of automated warehouse robots, now more than 100,000 machines strong, is working alongside human employees to help meet the e-commerce giant's massive fulfillment demand. For now, until the robots get tired of you humans and you're in their way, the company's robots carry inventory around massive warehouse floors, compiling all the items for a customer's order and reducing the need for human interaction with the products. But their chief technologist of Amazon Robotics, Ty Brady, insists that these robots are enhancing human efficiencies rather than eliminating warehouse jobs. Amazon has been going full steam ahead when it comes to hiring and now employs over half a million people. Brady views the robots as necessary to this growth. When there are tens of thousands of orders going on simultaneously, you are getting beyond what a human can do, he told the audience of the MIT Technology Review and first EM Tech Next conference today. Humans still provide necessary skills. Well, that's a relief. And fulfillment in the fulfillment process, like dexterity, adaptiveness, and plain old common sense. For example, when some popcorn butter accidentally fell off a pod in a fulfillment center, it got squished, creating a big buttery mess in the middle of the floor. The curious robots didn't know how to handle the situation, but wanted to go check it out. The robots were driving through it, and they'd slip and get it in the encoder, says Brady. Even if that, even if they haven't caused, even if they haven't caused layoffs, uh, 
Uh, for Amazon workers, the company's high-efficiency automated fulfillment efforts have contributed to massive retail job losses, which are disproportionately affecting women. Uh, its cashierless stores have also the potential to reshape retail employment. They don't, they don't go through and tell you what happened with that butter that was fell off the floor or off the shelf onto the floor. But you've got to imagine, that's the part that they think humans need to do. Mop up the messes. <laughs> we need janitors. Human janitors. <laughs> the robots will get all the good jobs, high-tech jobs. You you lowly humans, <laughs> you go and clean up, clean up after them. You go change their their diapers and such. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it says um, here that we have something called fulfillment by Amazon, says Brady. And it turns out that more than half of that inventory is sold by third-party vendors. These are mom-and-pop stores across the globe. That has actually been a great success for small businesses across the globe. And, and, I, and I agree. Uh, th those are good, except I tend to try to avoid those when when I when I buy stuff because it takes them longer to ship. <laughs> Which I know that's a bad thing, right? I should be looking for the third-party vendors to buy from, but uh, like I said, you know, they, they don't, they're not always covered by Prime shipping, and. Uh, <laughs> Oh, yeah. Fun, fun. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I'll save that one for next time. Oh, uh, yeah, I should have talked about this one when I was talking about the other one. It's basically the same story. But, you know... We sad. We sad folk now. Oh, wow. Bitcoin developers sad as Microsoft acquires GitHub. This is on uh, CryptoNewMedia.com. Dot press, excuse me. Uh, American Software Program. What? American Software Program big? Microsoft? It doesn't even make any sense. Anyway, has finalized the deal to amass GitHub, a code internet. Who this must not have been written in English. I, I don't know. A code internet hosting program for seven and a half billion dollars in firm stock. The official disclosure was made June fourth, virtually a complete week after rumors surrounding the acquisition spread like wildfire. Since GitHub hosts were. Uh, since GitHub hosts the underlying code of all kinds of open insider and proprietary software programs, many developers together were enraged on Bitcoin. I, I, I don't know, free, but somebody not somebody doing the ESL class maybe um, <laughs> wrote this. And we're enraged on Bitcoin. <laughs> Anyway, have been lower than enthusiastic um, over Microsoft shopping for the corporate. As an organization providing many services and prov providers, a lot of Microsoft's current and previous choices have been considerably controversial within the case of the home Windows 10 working system. What? Within the current and what the within the case of the home Windows 10 working system, for instance, the corporate's repute. <laughs> I can't read this. I read it when I was reading it to myself. It read fine, but reading it out loud it doesn't. It just doesn't track too well. You can get around all that reading it inside your head. <laughs> Anyway, um, Bitcoin and, and crypto coin developers um, that post their code up on GitHub are not happy about Microsoft doing that, doing what they've done, as you can imagine. Um, 
a lot of developers it's just not it's like I said, it's just not going to work out well for Microsoft. So uh, there's that. All right, we're going to hear some more music right now. I'm going to take you back, take you way back to 1968. Yeah, Bitcoin's doing all right. Well, you know, it could be worse. <laughs> it could be a lot better, that's for sure. But, uh, yeah, they're doing all right. Um, so, we're, we're, like I said, we're going to take you way back. This, this, is, this was one of my favorite albums for, for a long time. I, I, I used to listen to this all the time, over and over again. Drove my, my, drove my mama insane listening to this music pouring out of my bedroom. <laughs> when I was preteen, <laughs> listening to this. And it's the full version, 17 minutes, 12 seconds. Oh, yeah, Joan Jett. Love her. <laughs> Summertime blues there, Joan Jett and the Blackhearts. Uh, before that, we had Blind Faith doing Can't Find My Way Home. And we kicked it off with Iron Butterfly in Inna, Gata de Vida, or, if you prefer, In the Garden of Eden, uh, with the video showing kind of the whole Adam and Eve story there, raising up from the dust and uh, doing things, uh, fine, eating, eating the apple and, and of, from the tree of knowledge, uh, and uh, then becoming embarrassed that they were naked. <laughs> and then all the hell that brought on yeah as uh, Hansel who just arrived pointed out you're playing a very biblical song there <laughs> yes indeed in a God of the Vida uh, but, but, and the reason it was in a God of the Vida rather than in the Garden of Eden was because those boys when they were recording that song were so fried on acid that uh, they couldn't really pronounce the words properly <laughs> so in the Garden of Eden came out as Ida Gata De Vida. <laughs> hey, at least that's the uh, urban myth about it, and and I do believe it's that probably actually accurate. Uh, so you know, for what it's worth. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> and the rest is history. Yeah, I tell you, man, I I, I love that uh, that song, that whole album, actually. But uh, really, uh, In a God of Vida, I, I listened to that over and over and over again. I, I I used to drum out the drum solo there on my desks at school <laughs> when I was in uh, <laughs> elementary and junior high. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that that was uh, just good stuff, you know, just good stuff. I don't know what, what else you could say. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. For, li for little hippies, little hippies like I was back in the day, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, and I was already a hippie, started smoking weed when I was 13, <laughs> started having sex when I was 13. <laughs> Uh, I was a teen. I was a teen. I had to. It was. It was. It was my. It was my duty <laughs> as a teenager to be having fun and rebelling and all that stuff. You know, it did. It did. And 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 you know the the cool thing. And I think I've told this story here before on on Freakers Ball. Uh, that uh, yeah, the Mormons, the Mormons out there in Utah, they got me started on the weed. Yep, yep, them boys, them damn old farm boys in Utah got me started on the weed. <laughs> yeah, that was fun times, though, fun times, let me tell you. All right, oh, you guys probably don't want to care about that one, huh? Um. Oh! Yeah, and I think I posted this the other day. I don't know, maybe during Grammy's show. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know when I did. 
or not, but uh, just in case any of y'all interested. So they came. No, 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 no. I was, I was, I was up in work in Utah, Central Utah, working on this ranch up there. And uh, at, at this one point, um, and, and I didn't, I didn't normally work with these these guys, these two particular guys. But at this one point, it was a big job to do up on the mountain where they had this cabin up there and they had kind of a little off-site ranching area. Anyway, we had to go up there and build some fences and crap like that. Um, so it was just me and this one other guy around my age and these two older guys. They were they were in their 20s um, up there at the cabin. And so, you know, nighttime rolls around and you're there in the cabin because you got to work up there for a few days. And... Uh, <laughs> And the, and the guy pulls out this this bag of stuff, this green stuff. Oh, first he offered me a beer, and I I was thirteen that's the time. And he, so he offers me a beer, and I'm like, really? Because I, I don't think I ever drank beer before that. Anyway, I tried. And it was terrible beer. It was probably Coors or something like that. I don't know. Station wagons. Um, well, I had a station wagon, but not at that point. <laughs> Later on. <laughs> anyway, don't get don't get confused on station wagons. No, pickup trucks. Pickup trucks were involved. Um, no, 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 certainly not. <laughs> None of that. Um, anyway, so they, they pull out the beer, you know, because they're just, just partying dudes, you know, like I said, early 20s guys, and they, they pull out the beer, and they give me and this other guy a beer, and I'm drinking, it's like, ugh, that's kind of a little bit nasty there. Anyway, so then they pull out this bag of bag of baggy stuff, and, and it's and it's weed and and, uh, and he's hey you ever try this California boy that's what they called me California boy I was I was a hippie from California guy had long hair I'm not out there <laughs> in the middle of Mormon country <laughs> anyway so they they thought I figured I was a damn California hippie and I'd probably done all this stuff anyway but I, I hadn't you know I was just a kid. Uh, anyway, so then we, we smoked this weed, and, um, I, I, I believe I got high. I'm not positive on that. It could have been the beer. I don't know. It was stuff they grew up on the mountain. Um, <laughs> so, anyway, so that's that. And then when I got back to, back to San Diego, then I, I got some real weed. Well, real at the time, which was commercial, which is not really real weed. But whatever. Um, <laughs> Mormon Mountain Weed. Yeah, Mor Mormton, Mormton Weed. Exactly. Uh, anyway, so here's the story. Uh, I think I posted this the other day. And some of y'all uh, may be interested in this. I don't know why you would be, but some of y'all might be. From the Metro.co.uk. The next hot menswear trend is wearing trousers with a penis pocket. <laughs> Let me show you the picture. Let me show you the picture. Oh, God. Because <laughs> uh, this, 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 is, this is plain goofy. Um, where, where's my edge? I don't see my edge. Oh, oh, there's the edge. The edge is there. That's why I don't see it, because I, I moved it. All right. My edge was not where it was supposed to be. <laughs> In case you all might want to be looking to make a fashion statement. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Uh, balls to the wall, they say. Balls to the pants. All right. Um, so don't worry about people. Don't worry. People who have penises, you aren't being left out of all the ridiculous fashion going down. The next hot trend is another take on trousers. This item of clothing that's been the most messed with... What? That's been most messed with this year from extreme cutouts and bum-flashing rips... Rather than taking a distressed denim to new heights, these trousers are all in all pretty complete. Your bum isn't on show. There are no giant slashes that uh, they they do indeed in to function as trousers should. 
There's just one strange thing about them. They have a pocket directly over the penis area. <laughs> not, not a subtle pocket. We had a contrast pocket, seemingly designed to draw everybody's eye to your penis, to your crutch. Uh, the patch does indeed function as a pocket, but we're not sure what you might actually want to put in that pocket. Keys, wallet, phone, they'd all create bumpy appearance. Uh, maybe you want to carry your sausage. Carry, <laughs> carry your sausage around in your pocket. <laughs> you know, you go into the grocery store, and you pick up a, a, a banana. Maybe you want to put a, put a banana in there. Yeah, condom ants. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice one, Gramps. <laughs> uh, what will they think of next, and why? <laughs> yeah, that is a banana in my pocket. <laughs> oh. Whether I should cover this or not, I don't know. I don't really care about the story. But I'm going to... I had it in my list, so might as well give it to you. <laughs> that ain't no roll of pennies. That's, that's more like a roll of dollars. All right. Anyway. <laughs> Uncomfortable Starbucks employee respond to... Becoming the world's biggest public toilet. <laughs> Starbucks employees are bristling after being forced to sit through an entire day of training on racial bias last Tuesday, following an April incident in which Philadelphia, a Philadelphia manager called the police on a pair of black men who were sitting in the store without having purchased anything, which part sparked a nationwide protest and culminated with Starbucks becoming America's largest public toilet. <laughs> I feel bad for the people working there. I don't know. Well, of course they work at Starbucks. Hey, whatever. Anyway, in, in order to atone for the now fired manager's poor judgment, Starbucks rolled out a new inclusiveness policy, shattering 8,000 locations for a day of color brave training color brave training which included several documentary videos notebooks for employees to record their private thoughts and a 68 page employee guidebook which teaches employees about topics such as institutional racism and the history of prejudice According to the Wall Street Journal, they also listened to a series of audio recordings of Starbucks employees describing interactions that they have had with customers in which their own biases became apparent. The whole thing made many... Oh, what the hell happened there? I clicked something and it, and it took me to a picture that I didn't want to go to. Anyway, the whole thing made many employees, especially African Americans, highly uncomfortable. I don't think Starbucks realized how uncomfortable it would be for people that, of color to have to sit and watch these videos and talk about this, said biracial shift supervisor Jamie Prater of the Journal, uh, adding, but sometimes we need to be uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, I guess that is like a cod piece. <laughs> Uh, Cordell Lewis, manager of the Ferguson, Missouri, oh, what a famous city, uh, Starbucks, was among the employees who said the training seemed to make some African Americans uncomfortable. He said he could see employees' shoulders tighten as they leaned forward in their chairs. And they've got signs like, or uh, pictures here, the first step to becoming color brave. <laughs> the first step to becoming color brave, and then talks about institutional racism. Da, 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 da. Uh, the company's new inclusiveness training also warned employees not to accidentally mistake scruffy-looking husbands 
for homeless men. <laughs> in one, an employee recalled seeing a scruffy-looking man approach a woman in line and hold out his hand to her, after which the woman got money out of her purse. The employee said she went up to the man and told him panhandling isn't allowed in the store. The woman informed the employee that the man was her husband. <laughs> all right, all right. Color brave. I, I just, I just, I can't. I, 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 <laughs> I don't get it. I, I just don't. I, <laughs> I just don't get it. <laughs> And then you go up to some guy and you accuse him of panhandling and he's just getting some money from his wife. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I imagine they were. They were just trenches. Uh that people crapped in, you know. I, I, I don't. That's probably not. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, what else do I got here for you? Anything? Let me see here. I don't know. Nothing. I'm really too interested in. I'm looking at various stories I'd saved here. I got. I got a lot of stuff of uh, of interesting stuff. I got a. But uh, nothing, nothing really for you. Uh, oh, maybe uh, well, I'll save some of this for later. Uh, I don't need to deal with all that now. Of the new breeds of people discovered, <laughs> delusion, delusionalist. <laughs> yeah, I think there's more of those than anything at this point in time. I don't, I don't think there's a lot of people that uh, glom on to reality. Strange, I know. Strange. People are. Strange people are. People are strange. Yes, indeed, they are. People are strange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's uh, John Lee Hooker and uh, Lily Tap. Uh, boom, boom, boom. Yeah, I forget who requested that, Cowboy Deck or uh, Freeze? Somebody requested that. I don't know, but thank you. Uh, before that was Samantha Fish from last Sunday night live performance at the Crawfish Fest in New Jersey. Uh, somebody's. I was trying. And we kicked it off there with a song called People Are Strange by the Doors uh, with video scenes from the movie Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Yipper pepper. <laughs> Oh, fun, fun stuff, I tell you. Yeah. So, good night to Grammy. She she took off there during that last set. Midnight for her. What the hell did I do? What the hell did I not do? What the hell did I do? I didn't change my uh, camera. That's what I did. <laughs> Oh, uh, you know, the program, this program, OBS, can kind of make it seem like I'm almost professional, but you just can't get, get past my own uh, deficiencies there, <laughs> forgetting to do shit. Uh, i tell you one thing or two. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Look at there. Is that what I want? No, that's not what I want. We'll save that for next week. All right. Well, we got some more here. <laughs> oh, man. I hope it cools down a little more this weekend. It's supposed, to, it's supposed to, I think they said a high of 90 tomorrow or 88 or something like that. But regardless of that, that's, that's still plenty warm, you know. Um, but, but I need to get some yard work done, and I, and I hate doing it when it's, on, when it's that hot out there. I guess I guess I'd be happy it's not a hundred. Um, <laughs> but that's all right. We, we do what we do. We'll do what we have to do. Uh, you know. 
Where, where am I looking for? What am I looking for? What am I looking for? Uh, no, 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 not that, not that, not that. Where is it? I know it's in my list here. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um. Yeah, but I got a lot of. You know, the weeds be growing, and during this this heat here. Um. So I so, so I gotta I got I gotta get out there. Uh, eleven, 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 fifteen, seventeen. All right, seventeen. All right, we got that. <laughs> I mean, 43. Okay, great. So, um, do I have anything other stories for you? Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and mention this, just because it is that day. Well, at least it's still that day for me. It's probably not that day for some of y'all. Most of y'all. But it's still the 8th of June for me. And, and you know... How do they let them get away with this? How do they let them get away with this? Or how did they? And how do they continue to let them get away with the atrocities they commit? Fifty years ago, today, the NSA is still keeping details of, US, uh, of Israel's attack on the USS Liberty a secret. They're still keeping it a secret that Israel torpedoed the unarmed USS Liberty 50 years ago today. The torpedo tore through the side of the unarmed American naval vessel, USS Liberty. And I, and I have to mention that, Liberty. You know, it's real Liberty media. we got to talk about Liberty. Although, this, I doubt that ship had much to do with actual Liberty. Anyway, uh, approximately a dozen miles off the Sinai coast, the ship, whose crew was under command of the National Security Agency, was intercepting communications at the height of the Six-Day War when it came under direct Israeli aerial and naval assault. Reverberations from the torpedo blast sent crewman Ernie Gallo flying across the... Uh, yeah, not those kind of weeds, Hansel. <laughs> Reverberations from the torpedo blast sent crewman Ernie Gallo flying across the radio research room where he was stationed. Gallo, a communications technician aboard the Liberty, found himself and his fellow shipmates in the midst of an attack that would leave 34 Americans dead and 171 wounded. This week marks the 50th anniversary of the assault on the USS Liberty, and though it was among the worst attacks in the history of the non-combatant U.S. naval vessel, the tragedy remains shrouded in secrecy. The question of if and when Israeli forces became aware that they were killing Americans have proved a point of particular contention in the on-again, off-again public debate that has simmered for the last half a century. They knew before. They knew before they attacked who they were attacking. Don't be anybody trying to fool you on that. The Navy Court of Inquiry's investigation proceedings following the incident were held in closed sessions, and the survivors who had been on board received gag orders forbidding them to ever talk about what they had endured that day. Now, half a century later, The Intercept, which is where this is posted, theintercept.com, uh, the Intercept is publishing two classified documents provided in the cache of files leaked. Where, where, my thing moved on me. <laughs> Where'd it go? I lost my spot and I'm, and I'm lost here. Um, all right, where? Da, 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 da. Uh, that day. Okay, oh, there it is. Okay, by, uh, a cache of files leaked by NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden related to the attack and its aftermath. They reveal previously unknown involvement by the government communications headquarters, the UK Signals Intelligence Agency. Internal NSA communications that seem to bolster a signals intelligence analyst account of the incident, which framed it as in accident, as well as Hebrew transliteration systems 
unique to the NSA that was in use at least as recently as 2006. The first document, formerly unreleased, NSA classification guide details which elements of the incident the agency still regarded as secret in 2006. The second lists a series of unauthorized signals, uh, intelligence disclosures that have a de detrimental effect on our ability to produce the intelligence against terrorist targets and other targets of national concern. Remarkably, information relevant to the attack on the Liberty falls within the higher secret category. Though neither document reveals conclusive information about the causes of the assault, both highlight the time uh, at, at the time of their publication, approximately four decades after the incident, the NSA was determined to keep even seemingly minor details about the attack classified. The agency declined to comment for this article. Imagine that. The classification guide, dated November 8, 2006, indicates previously unknown GCHQ, that's a, a British intelligence agency, involvement in the ship's intelligence gathering. The specifics of this involvement remain classified, and it is therefore unclear if involvement was of material nature on board the ship or through other means. GCHQ also declined to comment. The guide also reveals NSA's own classified Hebrew transliteration system, the existence of which uh, under, un underlines the agency has historically counted Israel as an intelligence target, even though the nation acted as a key partner in the signals collection. The inherent tension in the U.S.-Israeli relation, US relationship was also manifest on the Liberty where the Hebrew translators brought aboard the ship were referred to as special Arabic linguists, according to the journal's James Bamford, journalist James Bamford, in, uh, in order to conceal the surveillance of Israeli communications. The Six-Day War between Israel and its neighbors Jordan, Syria, and Egypt was a conflict that the United States chose to stay out of, at least um, on the surface, Despite Israel's entreaties for military support, Egypt and Syria were Soviet allies at odds with American-aligned Israel. The local conflict could have easily turned into a direct conflict between the superpowers, which neither the U.S. nor the USSR at that point in time wanted. The countries directly involved uh, were left to fend for themselves in what proved to be an overwhelming military and territorial victory for Israel, using American weapons, of course. Uh, one that doubled the fledgling country's size in less than a week. They stole a bunch of land. Though the United States refused to intervene on behalf of its ally, it was nevertheless eavesdropping on the Israeli military communications during the war. There, according to Bamford, lies the rub. Over the course of Israel's remarkable territorial acquisition and the military victory, it's, alleged com it's allegedly committed a war crime by slaughtering Egyptian prisoners of war in the city of El Arashi, El Arish, in the northern Sinai. And they continue committing war crimes to this day, unhindered. Bamford argued in his 2001 book, Body of Secrets, that the USS Liberty's proximity to the Sinai and its ability to intercept Israel's uh, motives and activities during the Six-Day War might have prompted Israel to attack on the vessel. Might have. Using American weapons. Other national security experts, including Steve Aftergood of the Federation of American Scientists, disputed Bamford's analysis. However, according to Aftergood, who, uh, who directs the FAS Project on Government Secrecy and the killing of Egyptian POWs never happened, there appears to be no verifiable evidence that such a massacre ever took place, and Bamford's description of the events at El Arish does not hold up. After Good wrote in the 2001 publication, The Body of Secrets, 
here's the thing. We all know what happened. We all know what, exactly what happened over there. And and they can him and ha and make up stories all they want about this, about that situation. But it it, it, it was plainly obvious exactly what happened on that day to that ship 50 years ago today. And and they, like I said, they continue to get away with it to this very day. And the U.S. does nothing. The United Nations does nothing. And Israel's just kicking back laughing. They're just laughing. They're just thinking, you idiots. We, we can do whatever we want. You can't stop us. You won't stop us is, is probably... Uh, a, a better way to put that. I don't know. Whatever. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right. I, I think I think I'll finish with this story here. Um, just because it it made me laugh. Should it have made me laugh? I don't know, but it did make me laugh, and. <laughs> And maybe I'm a twisted motherfucker. Okay, more than maybe. But here it is for you. From Reductress.com Yay! This millennial got hit by a city bus and can finally pay off her student loans. <laughs> Let that be a lesson to the rest of y'all millennials out there that have racked up big, big amounts of student debt, uh, student loan debt. Yeah, go out there and get hit by a bus. The city or, or the government, whatever, will will pay. The, the rest of your taxpayers will pay your debt. Well, they'll give you a bunch of money anyway, whatever you happen to do with it. So getting hit by a city bus would be a tragedy for most people. But for Sophie Kraft, it was an opportunity to pay off the monstrous amount of debt she had accumulated in school. In an exciting turn of events... Sophie sustained six severe injuries that allowed her to sue the city and use the settlement to pay off her student loans. Yay! <laughs> all, all, you, all you millennials go out there and start jumping in front of buses. Anyway, uh, there's no amount of money that makes up for the trauma I went through, said Sophie, but it is definitely nice to be able to focus on healing and not the crushing weight of my, how about the crushing weight of the bus, the crushing weight of my student loan debt. This is honestly the only way I could have ever had enough money to pay it off. Well, you were in school learning something. Were you not planning on getting a job at the end of that? <laughs> Wow, how crazy. The only way a young person can get rid of student debt is by experiencing a devastating trauma and getting paid for the damages. <laughs> to be clear, I am experiencing PTSD, and I'll be in physical therapy for the rest of my life. Added Sophie, but I'm the only... I'm only one of my friends, the only one of my friends who isn't in debt, so... Yay. <laughs> You're right about that, bitch. Yay. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> she's going to be in physical therapy for the rest of her life. But she won't have the crushing student debt. Oh, my God. This is the uh, the logic held by these people. Oh, my God. All right, all right. I got to do this last set here. <laughs> oh, it's a crazy-ass world that we live in, let me tell you. All right, this is no FX. And this uh, song kind of says my thoughts. The idiots are taking over. Stoner Train. Uh, before that, we had the Black Angels do an entrance song. Uh, the uh, movie, uh, the, the Doors doing Roadhouse Blues to scenes from the movie Vanishing Point. 
uh, Mungo Jerry, which I do believe was a Hansel request there within the summertime, and we kicked it off with No FX. The idiots are taking over, have taken over already. <laughs> Oh, yes, it's a world full of idiots. Anyway, thank you all for tuning in. It's been a fun time here on the Balls to the Wall show. I'll be back next Friday with another Balls to the Wall show. And on Sunday morning uh, with uh, the Blues, at, well, morning, noon Eastern, uh, with the Blues right here for three hours and some trivia in the chat. There will not be a dark table show tomorrow, so just... Uh, mark your calendars or whatever. There won't be a dark table tomorrow. Um, in the afternoon on Sunday is Hal Anthony behind the woodshed opening up a big old can of whoop ass noon. What time Eastern? Noon Pacific, 3 Eastern. And at 7 Eastern is Gary L. and uh, Gigi's Boo on the road less traveled. I don't know if uh, that one new show for Sunday night, The uh, Voice of Rebellion, is, is going to be pushing his way over to our R's for this week or not. We'll find out over the weekend, so we'll see. If he does come on, he's a 9 p.m. Eastern show. And, uh, yeah, Grammy will be back Wednesday for another Rocket Chair. Talk to y'all later. Have a great week, and, uh, peace! <laughs>